And Dave, who just recovers from or recovered from his keynote. Um, so I guess th this will be interesting. My name is Thomas Schmidt. I'm from Hamburg, so I'm in between. Uh, um, this panel is actually initiated or was uh, um, uh, seeded by John from a, with, from a vision paper of John. And John is also the first to express his vision here. So um, John, please, uh, the floor is yours. OK, should I share my slides? Let's just see if this works. Um, yes, it works. Okay, do you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, right. So, hi, I'm John Crocroft. I'm from the Computer Lab in the University of Cambridge. I wish I could be there in Osaka with you, uh, uh, with the folks there. Uh, I love going to Japan, um, but I'm stuck here due to various National holiday yesterday, actually, a bit complicated. Traveling was difficult. Anyway, I'm going to just give a brief introduction to this, um, this idea. And uh, I don't I don't claim this is my idea. It just came out of uh, discussion with various people, um, uh, many of whom are associated with ICN. And this came out of work that I've been doing for a long time uh, back in the day, in, in the 1980s, uh, 86, I think, when we started looking at internet multicast. And basically, um, the, um, so I'm going to I'm going to channel Van Jacobson's description of of how he got from uh, the internet to ICN, uh, but in the in the middle I'm going to go through multicast and then say what the problems were and still are with the IP multicast, and then try to uh, extrapolate from those or or you by analogy go from those onto uh, 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 similar problems with ICN. And I'm not uh, trying to say nobody works on these problems, but that. They were architecturally important aspects that should have been considered uh, right from the very beginning. But of course, we didn't really know. I mean, this is a sort of retrospective, if you like, and it's difficult to, you know, the hindsight is tw 2020 is uh, a nice thing. So v Van always talked about this idea of what, what ch change between the telephone net and the internet. And one thing with the telephone network is that you know. The network knows who called whom. The network is uh, has a total knowledge. The, the phone number is actually the uh, actual physical uh, point on the wall where you plug a telephone in. And the telephone network knows who uh, who called whom, who owns that point, accounting information for that point, and so on. Um, and uh, and how long a call is, is part of call logging, is part of the call data record, is part of what happens. Of course, it doesn't know who said what, it doesn't know anything about content. We, we then had broadcast networks, TV and radio networks in the, uh, the early 20th century, um, where you know what's on because of a channel listing externally, a program listing, um, you know what band to listen to, what part of the spectrum a given TV or radio station is in, but the network certainly doesn't know who tuned in. That's very difficult to tell. The sender and network operators don't know. You have to build an entire separate infrastructure uh, to call up people on the telephone, and ask them what are they watching, uh, on the old broadcast networks. So in the internet, the network doesn't really know who sends what to whom. The routing system just forwards IP packets based on longest prefix matching. Uh, it doesn't know uh, flow state, um, but the receivers and senders know who sent things. A receiver knows what they get. So they know who sent what. And of course, we can add flow state logging in the network. We can do DPI or SDN or many other things um, if we want, uh, and then know the traffic matrix of who sends what to whom. And we might use that for various reasons. Security and accounting might be two of those. Um, so the story here sort of changes in about 1986 when Steve Daring was at Park, uh, Palo Alto Research Center, Xerox uh, uh, Labs, uh, and also doing his PhD at Stanford University, and decided to think about how uh, the internet could could combine uh, its unicast mechanism with a, a, something like broadcast, but more efficient, which was multicast. Um, now, multicast, the, the way he introduced it was that you have group addresses, which effectively are logical. They're no longer associated with a point in the network. Um, so a sender sends to a group, but it doesn't know uh, the membership of the group. That would need an external mechanism, just as the, the broadcast networks would need an external mechanism to know who the viewers of TV or listeners to radio were at any given time. So effectively, multicast unbound the recipient 
uh, by virtualizing the address. So, to, so the address, IP address no longer had information that mapped to a, an interface on a computer anywhere, which had sort of some similarity to a phone number. Um, and effectively what this does is it shifts away from a notion of where the recipient is. So it's sort of space shifting. And the original vision of ICN, and again, I'm sort of channeling a very early talk by Van Jacobson, which I, I put a link to uh, a YouTube video of that talk, or one of the versions of that talk, was that you can go a step further in this unbinding, um, that, that not only does the sender not know who recipients are, as with multicast, but the recipient doesn't know who the sender is, because in ICN, of course, we're not interested in a, an identity of a sender or location of a sender or any other aspect of sender. We're interested in content. It's a content networking system. And so we've unbound the sender as well as the recipient. And this is kind of interesting because the architecture has shifted away from the idea of uh, addresses for a session which could be identified by endpoints or indeed in the network, and has now moved to a point where content is moved around. People express interest in content in ICN. There are pending interest tables in some architectures, which look somewhat like uh, SG state in multicast, uh, but they, uh, they're, they're, they're local to a point in the network where content is being uh, cached and pushed out. Um, they're not uh, connected with end-to-end uh, connectivity or sessions or connections. So we've not only space shifted, we've also got this, this nice property of ICN, the really big, big win of ICN is to time shift. Uh, and of course, that's a big change for multicast. Uh, so in, in multicast, we space shifted, so we, we got rid of the notion of the, the recipient being specific and bound to a point, and you could do efficient distribution from a sender to many points. And now we can uh, efficiently di distribute content uh, to interest people who are interested in that content, but uh, we can also do it at a different time. We don't have to have recipients co-located uh, co in time or space, uh, which is a, you know, which is the sort of big step forward. So early on in multicast deployment, uh, people were very excited with IP multicast because of the efficiency gain in distribution of real-time content, particularly sports events, uh, things where many people were simultaneously interested in the same content. But um, experiences, particularly at Sprint, uh, which was one of the big tier one ISPs in America that deployed IP multicast for its customers, their customers really asked for it, uh, was that there were various quite serious problems with the architecture. And these aren't minor problems. Uh, one of the, the first problem with multicast was the possibility of distributed denial of service attacks became worse because a source gets the ability, any source gets the ability uh, to use the network as a multiplier, as a magnifier of a traffic attack. Uh, most of the traffic attacks uh, require some kind of leverage off of some point, often end systems are exploited, but if the network is also going to replicate packets to multiple recipients, that's problematic. And we'll see this has an analogy in ICN, but, uh, but it's, it's not quite the same. Um, the second problem with IP multicast is this unbinding of recipients meant that nobody could figure out how to do billing. Now, the internet doesn't typically do volume or time billing. That was a telephone network feature except when you get to how um, in different autonomous systems work out if they're going to peer or be customer providers. And then they look at the uh, ratio of sent to receive traffic and use that as part of their peering arrangements. And the fact that you don't know how many people are downstream of a branch point in a multicast tree in a distribution network causes a problem for billing. And this also has another problem for interdomain and interdomain multicast was never truly satisfactorily solved. Uh, we see IP multicast today in data centers and in specialized parts of the network where trading networks, for example, and some IPTV networks are still using IP multicast, but within a single domain. And the problem is that the peering arrangements and aggregation sort of techniques don't scale well across AS boundaries with multicast because you don't have the requisite information. Now, there could be other problems, but these were the three, I think, top problems that the, uh, the folks at Sprint um, Research identified uh, a long time ago now. It's like nearly 30 years ago, and they're largely unsolved, although there are ideas in recent advances in, in internet research that, 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 that might well 
uh, start to let us uh, tackle these uh, more generally. Uh, there are sort of point solutions, sort of patchwork solutions, but one could imagine um, uh, um, uh, more general solutions in the modern time. So, but going to, going from multicast to ICN or content centric networking, um, we have um, these analogous uh, problems with IP multicast. The problem was pollution of the recipient's uh, data by other senders sending into the group. And there was no control in the original architecture about who could send. Uh, that was modified later in IP multicast. So you have source specific multicast or single source multicast, um, but that does actually restrict the architecture from its sort of full value for group communication. But but for IPTV, it certainly is a sort of reasonable restriction. Um, but you still have potential for problems there. And in in in, in um, when you have content and you have caches in the network, uh, then there are attacks on the caches. There's cache pollution attacks. Now there's lots and lots of work. I know in in this conference in previous editions there have been great papers on solving that problem um, but it's kind of it's kind of an interesting thing that a overlaid content distribution network typically doesn't have that problem because it controls everything from uh, the sources through the whole network because Akamai, for example, have customers and they know only their customers are paying to distribute this content to these recipients and they have control. Uh, when you push the, the architecture down into the network and you push the caching into the network, then you have to worry about how you generally solve this, this part of the problem. The second problem is how you do billing. And again, uh, you've got uh, traffic moving through the network, so that has a network cost, but now you have traffic in caches and uh, disks, uh, uh, presumably largely SSD these days, but the, you know that, that has a cost, uh, has an energy consumption as well. And so you need to figure out how you charge and you, not knowing who the people are who are getting the content, where or when they're getting the content, you have a problem for assigning the, you know, the, 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 the resource usage uh, uh, to a particular person. So you may in the network uh, be able to figure out or at a given point in the network figure out um, that traffic is moving from a given point to somewhere um, at, at a given time, but you don't know, you know, further downstream who that's going to, maybe going through further caches. And so you need to figure out how you uh, deal with that. And then the third point is interdomain. Again, you have this problem because you don't necessarily know how to assign uh, costs and AS is now really care about that assignment of costs and something is causing traffic and somebody has interest, but that interest information is distributed. Uh, it's not associated with what you can see at a point in the network. And now you need to think about how you build an entire new infrastructure for measuring uh, that impact on the network resources between ASs as well as within an AS, so you can actually figure out uh, assigning costs. It, it may not be that you have to send a bill to somebody, but you still need to figure out how to provision the network for further demands, for example, which is the, sort of the other side of that coin. Um, so I think there are solutions. When I originally wrote this note, uh, people criticized me quite correctly, say, oh, you're just, you're just listing these problems. And of course, there are solutions out there. Um, in in IP multicast, one of the things to think about is that uh, it's receiver driven. If you start from the receiver rather than the sender, then you can move through the network from the receiver as in fact how reverse path multicast routing works. You flip everything around and thinking, but it's also how you think about reliability. And you could also use this uh, for moving from somebody who's got content through the network, uh, through the caches and, and do the accounting that way. And of course, we now have the uh, capability to think seriously about in-network processing. And David Rann actually already forward referenced this somewhat. Uh, we've seen groups in the IETF and IRTF working on this. And um, uh, in fact, the idea goes back a long way in one of the extensions to IP multicast for trading networks, pragmatic general multicast. There actually was a technique for in-network processing, which uh, was was quite general. It allowed you to tap uh, arbitrary application functions in the network, not completely arbitrary, but that would potentially allow you to do uh, pricing and accounting at least um, uh, for uh, recursively figuring out what the distribution tree for content was. And this would apply for ICN equally to, to IP multicast. So you, you, you just instrument this, you have an API for this. And then the last point about this is that I really think we need to combine uh, uh, software uh, defined networking um, with BGP. 
uh, for into AS or into domain traffic, we need to have a common API for, for the border gateway protocol so that systems that have an implication for into AS traffic can actually talk to the AS level of the routing system and exchange information that could be used for this into domain accounting uh, rather than having sort of arbitrary made up tricks after the event. Um, so that that that's it for my quick introduction. It was just to say, you know, having looked at uh, these problems for a long time in multicast, it occurred to me they had analogies in, in ICN and, and particularly because we're pushing this down into the network, you, then they're not automatically solved by an overlay or a, a content distribution network, which has built in solutions to that, but also it has the narrow application, the generality of um, uh, of uh, uh, of ICN in the same way the generality of multicast creates these problems and they have to be confronted within the network. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen at that point and go back to uh, everyone else and, and let the chair take over. But thanks for your attention and uh, 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 over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John, for uh, pointing at, I believe, uh, many uh, pretty serious points. And I would like to ask George now to, to, to take over and, uh, and uh, yeah, put his position uh, onto the panel. Hi everyone. Um, in the same time, on the next generation uh, from from John, because when I started working on multicast, is the time when his student Tony Ballard he was graduating, um, having completed his PhD on CBT. And I remember I actually had contacted him to get his PhD. So in the mid nineties, multicast was a big thing. We all thought it's going to take off, but it didn't take off. And by ninety seven, ninety eight, it seemed it, it, there is a problem. Uh, then the paper that John mentioned came out and put everything in perspective and so that, you know, there are so many problems uh, that you need to solve to make multicast a reality. Um, so then I forgot about it. And then in 2011, uh, John was, was giving a talk in our summer school and he said that, you know, there is one use case for multicast and it is IPTV. And a few years later, I actually had a project where we had uh, a provider with us, a European project, and we had an actual ISP that was running IPTV. Uh, and I found out that not only they did use IP multicast, they actually had to bend over backwards to make it work. They, they, they needed special switches that do IGMP uh, snooping, I think that's what it's called, uh, and the special engineer network to make it work. So what I got out of that was that despite the problems that multicast has in order to be acceptable, if you have a use case for it, it's going to happen. Of course, it's going to happen only within one ISP. It's going to need a special engineer network. And in this case, you don't have the problem with billing because you are just saving money. You're, the customers are paying the same money they, they paid anyway. Uh, you don't have in the domain and that may be, that's actually good because you can do geofencing and everything. Um, but the thing is that you need the application first, and the application for that was what? I think the main problem with multicast was uh, we didn't have a very good application for that. And a good application is something where everybody wants to get the same content at the exact same time. So this is TV. And when you have regular TV, you don't care that much about IPTV, unless if it's going to be much better, more channels, more whatever, more anything, better reception or whatever. And I think the lesson that we can get for, I, for ICN from that is that ICN can happen if there is a very, very good application for it. Um, and having spent some years in ICN as everybody else, um, I think many of the applications we envisioned originally, which was content distribution instead of the web or CDMs, I mean, they are good applications. And if it, the, we really had two alternative networks, one doing whatever the, the web is doing and the other one doing ICN, maybe the ICN network would win out. But since you already have the network that does this well enough, it's hard to switch. So I've been thinking, what is the application that would make us go to ICN, like full scale, or maybe, I mean, even a limited scale. Um, and I've come to the conclusion that the only application that I can see is anything that has to do with content security and content privacy. Control over the content itself, I think, is something very, very important that you cannot do very well on the web because you just have end-to-end -end security and you just have to trust an endpoint. You don't trust the content itself. 
So you know, for the past few years, I've been thinking that whenever I'm seeing I mean, my own papers, the papers that I see from others, the only ones that seem to make an impact on me anymore are the ones that are showing new ways to safeguard privacy or anonymity or ensure content security without relying on 100 different PKIs. I think these are the ones that make sense to me because the focus on the content is something that you can, you can use to enhance security, to enhance your trust or anything. Uh, so I think this may be one thing that we can get out of multicast, that we need this, this application. And this application may be something that has to do uh, with security. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if it's enough to sway everybody to going into ICN, but I think that you know, any kind of good application will have this at its center as opposed to say content distribution, because we can do that well enough right now. We may not, I mean, we don't really need ICM to do it. It would be better, but we don't really need it. So we don't have to invent new technologies to do it. But with security, we don't have it. And we actually do need it and we need it very badly. Uh, so that was my take on that. Yeah, thanks, George. Um, so Dave, you, you recovered, so then it's your turn. <laughs> so I'm I'm going to give a completely different take on this. Um, I think it's potentially a mind trap to think about the multi-destination delivery capability of ICN is in any way analogous to IP multicast. Um, IP multicast has a, a few characteristics that just don't carry over. One is that it's push-based. It's based on what the sender wants to send at any given time rather than what the receivers want to receive at any given time. The second part is that <clears throat> the mechanisms that IP has for dealing with multicast all attempt to minimize delay dispersion, meaning how much differential delay all the different receivers of the content have relative to each other and relative to the moment it was sent by the sender. And third, um, the uh, way multicast distribution trees or distribution protocols are, have been done classically in the IP world is that they leverage the unicast routing protocols and do this inversion. And from an economic standpoint, this is a really bad deal for the network provider because much of the economics of unicast delivery in IP is based on the idea of hot potato routing. ISPs can craft their, uni their, uh, their unicast routing to get to the closest exit. Get the packet off my network as soon as possible. When you turn that on its heels and use those protocols for multicast, you wind up with cold potato routing, which means the packets tend to get pulled onto your network and stay on your network as long as possible before ever exiting. So the economics of offering, at least if you're a transit, and multicast service with IP look very uh, unattractive, um, whether you can bill for it or not. So when you look at ICN as, as, as multi-destination delivery, it doesn't attempt to minimize delay dispersion, but instead has a capability that IP multicast never had, which is explicit expiration of the validity of data. So the bound on the usefulness of data is explicitly encoded with the data through data ex explora exploration. And that information is actually sealed via the security protocols into the integrity envelope of the data. This means that it, the, the process of minimizing delay dispersion is, um, is sort of like independent of data validity time. And um, the, the lifetime of data in the caches is not something that it needs to be sort of intuited from the operation of your network, but can be explicitly derived from the, um, from the lifetime of the data itself. And um, this doesn't actually solve the resource allocation or billing problem, but it certainly gives you two handles that you didn't really have in the IP multicast world. One is the richness of the names, which allows you to um, attach um, identifiers of, of groupings and equivalence classes of content um, for managing caches, and second, expiration time for managing the longevity of information in the caches. So um, 
My, my point of view is thinking back to IP multicast and say, how do we solve the problems that IP multicast had with ICN? Doesn't strike me as necessarily the most productive direction, but rather how do we make the multi-destination delivery capabilities of ICN as valuable and as useful as possible and exploit those in applications without having to think about it in terms of the classic ideas of multicast that we've had in the past. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thanks, Dave. Um, I will try to start a discussion by posing the first question. We see what comes up in the Slack next. Uh, and my question will be, um, we have seen during the last years um, a trend on the internet uh, that is sometimes called consolidation, sometimes it's also called monopolization. And these, uh, these uh, players that consolidate or monopolize in, in major parts build, uh, um, I mean, uh, are built on uh, proprietary uh, distribution and uh, caching infrastructure and on tracking users and ad consumptions uh, um, to, to, uh, to collect data and to, to bill on the, uh, on the value of ads. And uh, if we look at multicast, John already pointed out the, the tracking of, of, the, of the recipients is uh, not easily possible, is vanished. The same goes for ICN uh, or similar uh, things go for ICN. ICN adds content object security, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, opposed to session uh, encryption and, uh, and uh, hidden transport and also uh, ubiquitous caching. So my question would be, is, um, well, positively speaking, ICN a, a valid approach to, um, to change this consolidation trend or the negative speaking is actually, does ICN have no chance because it, it, it stands in the, in the way of this uh, consolidation trend? That's, um... There's a kind of intersection between what you just asked and what Dave just said, um, which is that you have you have this. I mean, ICN has this built-in API, which is the the namespace is that API. I mean, that it, it's supported by an API, and the expiration is super interesting because you, you essentially know you know about what an object is. You 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 can get size information, and you and you've got this expiration, and in a way, if you imagine the original view of um of, of icn is that most of most traffic on the internet at least until until the pandemic most traffic was not real-time video it was, it was you know streamed content it was the objects being downloaded and there weren't humans at more than one end or the receiver end and so actually the the the, the duration of content in storage should be everything you need to know for the majority of peering arrangements. So peering arrangements for ISP. So I was going back to this is my third problem of multicast. It's a problem for you know for for um, interdomain for for any form of traffic resource accounting. But actually, you have a resource accounting mechanism in ICN, and so actually that's a very astute point that Dave made, which is within a single domain. Obviously, uh, somebody doing content centric networking or any other. Any other thing where they're capturing value of the end end uh, end to end application as well as network is kind of problematic because they're kind of moving into this kind of control of everything. But at least uh, when you have multiple ISPs and they may be sourcing uh, content from multiple creators and and um, uh, uh, and have you know many customers from different niche but bits of the market. Uh, at least, at least you have an API for accounting directly in ICN. So actually, that ha hadn't occurred to me. Sort of my my third sort of criticism, or my sort of second and a half and third criticism coming from multicast are actually incorrect. <laughs> uh, that actually there is already an API there. Although of course you have to make it network visible, but by pushing uh, uh, content into the network layer, you make it network visible. So that's actually pretty neat. Um, uh, and that potentially means that you have a market because you can have people competing for providing, well, not just the different content, but even the same content. So if, you, um, if you're watching a lot of TV in the modern world uh, where you're streaming content, you'll find many bundles contain similar programs, 
or the same programs indeed you know you can get marvel from marvel or disney or from some other channel so that suggests that you know that an open api for accounting for content uh so, as well as you know who created it and so on all the normal things but also the the durability or you know vol or, or volatility or whatever uh is super interesting because it's part of a whole package which um which directly speaks to a much richer way of doing something and kind of potentially prevents from monopolization maybe um which is kind of interesting um i don't know if that that answers your question i was just trying to link back from from that to, to dave's uh point about the um uh, yeah, the, the, yeah. The other thing that Dave was talking about, I, I wish I could be there. We can have a discussion over a, a cup of tea or something because uh, the um, many beers, many beers, many beers. Well, uh, the, this time of day there, I think it would be, be some nice, nice green tea would be good. But um, but yeah, the 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 the, the whole um, tree construction thing is is a, is another aspect. Although there are other ways of doing the um, uh, you know creating the distribution trees but I think they don't apply to a, a network of caches in the same way so clearly the way you do that is quite different um, although actually any coordinate cache coordination protocol would actually tend to create monopolies of content distributor well it could anyway somebody has control over many caches starts to look like a cdn like akamai and then they 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 creep back into having this sort of central control uh, which could be problematic uh, from the market point of view. Uh, speaking from Europe, I'm going to remind people who may not be aware in other parts of the world that we have these digital service and digital market acts in Europe, which actually are very strong pushes towards making open competition at every level of technology, um, uh, the, the kind of technologies we're talking about. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how they play out. I, don't, I haven't seen anyone write about how they would apply to ICN, um, so it would be super interesting to know uh, if there are any uh, regulatory people there as well. Uh, not not my area, though. Anyway, enough from me. I guess uh, we agree on this point that um, <clears throat> having the content secured itself uh, as by object security and making it cacheable, for instance, at eyeballs, prevents uh, the control on who can cache the content, right? So let me, let me, as I usually do, come at this from like 90 degrees off, since you asked the centralization question. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you peel the specifics of the protocol architecture away, there are three resources involved, right? There's computation, there's bandwidth, and there's storage. And who owns which of those resources, I think, is the thing that leverages or, or changes the balance in terms of who sent, what is centralized by whom under what circumstances? So, for example, um, if you if you assume um, a, an ICN-ish kind of world where the storage is owned by the same people who own the bandwidth, you wind up with a different pricing structure and a different ownership structure of the resources needed to deliver things than a, a world in which the storage is owned by a different organization from the people who own the bandwidth, which is what we have with, for example, today's CDNs, right? So um, if the purpose of caching uh, primarily is to lower your bandwidth costs, you will find that having the caches owned by um, the people paying for the bandwidth um, is a, is, is a is very, very attractive, as opposed to having the caches owned by somebody who then has to balance the, um, the access to their storage across multiple customers and figure out how to bill for that. So at some sense, I would say that um, the, the, the centralization equation has a lot to do with um, who owns which of these resources as opposed to what the particulars of the protocol architecture are? But the protocol architecture actually, and oops, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, the protocol architecture actually enables or disables certain certain constellations you, meant, you, you named, right? Well, just because you have layer three caches doesn't mean you can't have layer seven caches as well, 
right? I mean, one way to look at, at caching an ICN is, is um, and I, 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 I sort of was pushing on this in the very early days when, when I was trying to figure out how to build a router, was um, it has this nice property of unifying retransmission buffers with, uh, with a longer term uh, storage of, of data in flight. Uh, so you can rely on your, your or when you're caching in your interest retransmission rather than having separate um, retransmission resources and large buffers on your links um, in order to deal with reliability problems. So one way to think about ICN caching is you, you actually don't use it for, for long-term uh, data storage except to recover um, and cover over for disruptions. And that's a that's a uh, an interesting another interesting aspect to this, which is what type of disruptions do you want to protect your service from, right? Um, a, a an internet streaming video streaming company may have a different view on what type of, of failure they want to cover than say an ISP, right? Uh, because the the internet streaming people may may think it's important to deal with the failure of an entire large ISP and need to redirect their traffic to other paths. Whereas the ISP's point of view is what? My network never fails. Right, so they don't worry about that. Okay, so um, there is a um, remark in the Slack from Dirk, uh, and he says this, um, <clears throat> The surveillance, <clears throat> the surveillance topic might be orthogonal to the multicast discussion. If you ran a commercial media streaming service, you could use still multi-destination delivery mechanisms that do not need consumer identities or distributing uh, for distributing the data. But there would still be an uh, individual relationship to consumers for authentication, access control, and key distribution that, that's sufficiently for tracking behavior. Um, yeah, which is once again a different player that uh, Dirk, Dirk mentions, right? The, the Access is a different player than the, the Googles and the Akamais, right? Okay, um, there's no other question on the Slack, so maybe I, I pose another one, um, which is about the naming granularity. We have um, <clears throat> we have multicast, and you may think of uh, multicast addresses as uh, as distribution channel names. They are not. Uh, I mean, these addresses are not really uh, uh, do not uh, have a topological role. And we have the ICN naming of data chunks, which is a well what, quite the contrary, a very small entities. And uh, in between, we have something like the web, which names pages. So um, is this um, what would be actually appropriate? What, if we redesign the ICN or the multicast world, uh, what would we do? Would we go either way uh, or do something different? Well, now that's a great question. <laughs> so, yeah. Um... I mean, I think I think this goes back to where my starting point was uh, ignoring uh, for a moment the earlier uh, correct criticism from Dave about the the nature of the multi destination. The thing about the way I think about multicast, I think we ended up thinking about it as a as a channel that was described by SG State um, source source group state, and um, that 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 was not multicast addresses. So the unit was this sort of session unit. Uh, which was um, which which uh, uh, and and actually I think my favorite paper in this area was the the th the one from from the folks at LPL was uh, about um, essentially about whiteboards but it was about how to build what reliable multicast saleable reliable multicast which basically traded on SG state and and it was kind of interesting but that's got very very different requirements from content uh, naming. Um, maybe maybe it does but maybe it doesn't if you start to think about applications doing group communication and moving objects around in shared applications it starts to look very similar so if people 
can go back. I haven't got the reference to hand, but you go back and look at the the SRM paper. Um, it, it might have a very good synergy for thinking about identifiers. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, there was, um, yeah, there was a moment in in the whiteboard where it was very interesting because you join a a session in the at the original Embo in the multicast world, and you you'd start the whiteboard and you would get uh, slowly updated with all the content that people have put on any given whiteboard session. But there was actually a quite amusing bug in the system, which was um, that uh, Van Jacobson had implemented this with a persistent state model, um, and um, uh, effectively you couldn't ever kill it. Uh, you couldn't ever sort of terminate. So the thing would infinitely, effectively was a you know, lazy evaluation, infinitely executing this whiteboard uh, through actually display postscript. It's a very cool application. Um, uh, uh, so in a way it had the opposite of this sort of durability idea that it was sort of infinitely durable. Um, objects on the whiteboard in a given SG session would, would persist forever. Um, which of course meant that you know if you join one of these sessions a year later, it might take you several days to get the full updates in your whiteboard, which is kind of an interesting world. I mean, you know, there's a persistent programming world. It's kind of fascinating. But the we there's never release of the source code of that system. It would be super interesting to see what the internal identifier structures was for objects on the whiteboard. Uh, so essentially, they had to be painted on each page of the whiteboard independently, so they had structure. Uh, so the root of the structure was the source group, but the but then there was the page number and the display postscript and so on. So it would be really interesting. So if somebody could nail down the author and say, could you actually ever release the source code? And we'll just describe the identifier space in this because that might be interesting. Um, but what's the yeah that that so that must have had a finer grain than this time based. It was sort of object based. Um, so what's the appropriate? And then it, obviously URIs in the web are. Uh, they're a, they're a clue, right? I mean, they, you know, Berners Lee was a genius who came up, is a genius who came up with this great system, but it's been pushed into a really extreme, you know, misuse in many ways in the web. I think ICN is a much cleaner space for, for namespaces. Um, uh, but, and, but to be fair, multicast is a bit of a kind of kludge. And uh, as soon as you build applications with multiple senders and, and, and uh, shared objects, then you end up yeah, throw it away and do it again with ICM. Maybe we could persuade somebody to rewrite the whiteboard as an ICN app. That would be cool. I think John brings up a very interesting point here that SRM uh, was a technique, a networking technique to do recovery, but it was actually embedded in a very, very specific application. So there was an application model there. And I think one of the problems that we have with ICN, when we're trying to think about what the name should be like, would, should the name describe an entire book or a page or a paragraph or something, is that there are different applications that have different application models. Uh, so as long as you're in the application, you can do whatever you want. Just the peers have to decide on that. But when you push that down to the network, it's not so easy to say that this is the best way to do it and it will work for any application. Um, and I think even uh, one of the things that I liked very much originally about CCN was the idea that you didn't really know what the structure of the names was necessarily. You could walk the namespace, but I understand that this was something that was removed from NDN uh, because it was to call, I, I don't want to, I don't know why. Uh, so maybe somebody else would explain that better than me. So I don't want to presume why it was why that happened. But I think that wasn't that was an interesting idea that you have a namespace that you can discover. So potentially it can be anything, uh, but it seems that this is not very practical. Um, so getting to a namespace that everybody will agree on what should be the granularity, and this is not so simple because if, if the objects are huge, how are you going to cast them? You need them to be reasonably sized if cast makes sense. So there are many, many problems around naming that have to do with the disconnect between what the application wants to do and what the network should do presumably for every application. Uh, so I don't know if that's a problem that we can all solve easily. So, <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> maybe there's a dis there's discussion going on. I'm 
supposedly able to to unmute Dirk, but it doesn't work actually. Request, oops, I can only request to unmute Dirk. Maybe someone in the. Can you unmute one of the WebEx participants? Let me know when you get Dirk talking, but Please I want it. to. Oh, go oh. ahead. Yep. George, we can talk over a beer about why the content discovery stuff got removed from Indiana, okay? <laughs> well, so that doesn't seem to work to get, now he's muted again. It's a bit, I don't know. Um, How's so, that? Ah, here you are. Go ahead. Uh, um... Yeah, thanks for, for um, pulling me in. Um, yeah, we had a bit of discussion on the um, Slack channel. Um, so um, I think uh, we could, so coming back to this um, surveillance and tracking point, um, I think it's, it's it's really like Dave said. So it's it's really more question of um, you know who owns and controls the infrastructure and also how you design the system in the end. Um, so real systems, I think, would certainly benefit a lot from, for example, ICN multi-destination delivery, but, and then you have um, like uh, interest data and consumer anonymity for that. But, um, well, of course, there's all kinds of stuff around it, right? So you need to log in, you need to do key change over, you need to fetch manifest perhaps, or control something. So that I think is slightly orthogonal, um, um, and so it's not just a, a question of the of the really fundamental, um, say, multi-destination or multicast mechanism. Uh, there's actually an interesting take here when we think about um, uh, music and video, and even much more in games. Uh, increasingly, these things are constructed out of lots of fine grained components. Um, and I remember seeing at Technicolor Labs uh, a service that they built, which was to replace uh, a product um, placement in movies. So if you had a, uh, an American movie showing in Europe, instead of having a can of Coke in somebody's hand, uh, they would have a can of whatever the local drink was in that country, you know, so in France, it would be like Perrier, let's say. Um, and they'd automatically do that replacement because the objects were tagged in the MPEG structure of the, of the video, so they could do that. Um, uh, and then, you know, that's pretty impressive. But nowadays, you go much further. Uh, you have, you know, the large fractions of movies are constructed by uh, um, CGI and so on. So actually, the, the fine grain naming a piece of a movie I mean, it's not just you know a, a five minute segment of a film you know an extract or a highlight on youtube uh, there actually is a lot of structure in there um uh, and you can easily imagine you know different edits of movies being available um and that that's also been been true with music for some time where people who, who are learning pieces of music can get a version of any recording uh, with a single instrument missing and you get all the other instruments so you can rehearse or practice against the, the track but that there are also finer grain versions of that so actually i'm not sure we can um we can rule out they're being very fine grain and then with ais that are constructing content you know by learning from many many examples dali there's, there's, there's dozens of them now these large foundational ai models that that will build you an example uh, image or movie or whatever um this is not about fake it's about you know creating new content by learning from lots of components um so so this is another example where this kind of fine grain naming um you know could be could be very very general if we get it get it um what it is it is pretty much there isn't it so um so again we can get away from these old ideas of naming sessions that involve just time between participants and thinking about object structure which uh, there's plenty of rich literature out there already so yeah cool cool um direction um so you can imagine having a icn enabled dal e 
I think this is the thing to, there's another thing to build. Yeah, and I think it's also um, um, like fascinating to maybe think beyond the, the, the like traditional IPTV model, uh, but think more about like like more in interesting, say, multi-source applications. I mean, metaverse, quote unquote, or these kind of things. But you, you have multiple feeds coming in, and um, you, certain user groups sh share some of these feeds, and um, so you're switching um, things dynamically. Um, and um, so it would be really great to, to be able to do this in a scalable way and also with some like limited support for sort of time shifted um, um, viewing and, 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 and uh, mobility and these things. Okay, so I would, I mean, there is one big question that actually went through the talks and the, the talk of Dave, the talk of uh, John, and uh, this also is an inherent question uh, or already from the multicast times, and this is the question of the layer. There was with overlay multicast a big discussion whether um, multicast actually should be on on the application layer and not in the network, and the question where ICN should reside also occurred in both uh, the talks of. Sure, I understand what you're getting at. <laughs> Is it that we can get many of the properties of ICN without worrying about the end part by doing everything at layer seven? I mean, that's what CDNs do, obviously. Yes, CDNs definitely are, are on the application layer, yeah, uh, but they, they work not exactly like uh, ICN, so uh, and it could be an application layer service that is uh, omnipresent. Uh, um. So there's another aspect we haven't really talked about, maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll bring it up because um, supporting uh, multicast and to some extent multi destination delivery does amplify uh, certain certain problems with um, uh, with security, which is um, in the past um, the general approach to security, particularly to do channel security, is by controlling who has possession of the bits, you control the overall security of the system. And in order to keep things secure, you have to prevent certain people from getting a hold of the bits. And the object security model in ICN basically allows you to, to think of things in terms of, I don't care who has the bits. Anybody can have the bits. The only thing that matters is who has the decryption keys um, to be able to do something with the bits. Um, and there was a there was a session at AAAS. Um, I was on with, with with Vint, and a bunch of people were pointing out that that basically you can never erase anything. Um, once once the bits escape, the bits are gone. You can never you can never get them back. You can never make them go away. So the only way to properly secure things, uh, at least from a confidentiality standpoint, we can talk about integrity separately, is to control um, the availability, the longevity of the keys. Now, when you translate this into multi-destination delivery, what this basically says is, um, depending on who pays for the bandwidth to, to uh, obtain the bits, this does not have to be coupled in any way with who has the rights to do something with the bits. So if I, as, a, if I, as somebody, wants to spend my money uh, retrieving useless bits over my downlink from my ISP provider, uh, that supposedly I paid for in my monthly charge or even by per usage. That's my problem, right? That's not the ISP's problem. That's not the network owner's problem. Um, the owner of the content and the provider of the content is the one that determines whether um, he'll, they'll give me the keys to be able to do something useful with things. And I think we have not really significantly enough exploited that decoupling um, 
in, 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 in our transition from channel security to object security. So if you start from the, the, from the position that you cannot in any way control who has possession of the bits for how long and where, uh, you wind up with a different system architecture than if you attempt to control the distribution of the bits. Thanks. Hi, Thomas. So we have the uh, question from the floor. Please uh, come to the mic. Okay. Ah, okay. Please go ahead. Well, so Dave's last comment kind of anticipated what I was going to say. I mean, the unicast IP net best effort network layer has a very simple uh, uh, trust structure, right? I, I hand the network packet with destination address, I, and I don't have to think about it. I know what the network's going to do. And pretty much everything we talk, we've been talking about, has, it makes the model of the, the what the user is asking of the network or the, what the network is doing on behalf of the user gets more complicated and that trust structure gets more complicated. And I'm wondering if that, uh, whether that has, uh, and, and also I think incentives, uh, especially, you know, compensation flow is a, a, a very important aspect of establishing that that trust and i wonder if that's a way to sort of uh tie together some of the thing the themes that you've been talking about both in dave's talk and and here uh is you know was it really a good idea to push these things down into the network layer i guess maybe that's that's kind of my question is it is it Humans seem to have a hard time with trust when you don't, when we're not face to face. And uh, I think some of these things manifest that aspect. So I just like to get reactions on them. Thanks. Well, we all know that the narrow waist of the internet is HTTP, right? Not IP. And I think it is wrong. And as a narrow waste of a network, it must deliver. And HTTP itself doesn't do routing to do the global delivery. It depends on the, some substrate that can do routing. So therefore, I think uh, uh, someone wrote this paper a long time ago to say HTTP is a new narrow waste. And that didn't cause much attention is because HTTP doesn't do routing. Narrow waste must do routing. Well, uh, HTTP plus DNS does the routing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> DNS itself live without routing. Uh, without well, routing, you, you, nothing gets delivered. You assume that the whatever the network is is a fully connected topology in a in a mesh topology, um, but, and uh, then DNS and HTTP do all the routing. I'm not serious about this. You right, know, that's right. So. <laughs> not, not, that's, but, so uh, I've been trying to type on the uh, Slack. It's easier just to speak out here. I think that it's a really in, in retrospect. At the time when Steve Duren uh, submitted a thesis, I think it was in 1990, when both he and I were at the Xerox Park, wait, I, mean, I didn't see where this was heading to. But I think the IP multicast really took the very first step what this direction recognizing networking is not about connections. It's about uh, data delivery. But uh, as the very first step, you know, a far side is not going uh, far enough. It's over it's so many years, we started seeing more clearly. So I, I typed in the Slack already. I think IP multicast really disguise the architectural changes. Um, it, it just said, hey, it's 32 bits. Does it look like IP address? Let's call it IP. But it's not IP at all. Um, it changed the IP's push packets to the receiver pulling packets. It changed the IP's stateless forwarding to stateful forwarding. Those architectural changes are costly. Nobody pays that cost. 
without new functionality, not just improvement of performance and not just in, uh, reduction in cost. Because for that, like people learned overlay. Overlay will do the trick. However complicated or you know, patch, whatever you call it, it works. And it's pretty mature. So therefore, um, I, I don't think multicast, IP multicast that has much of a future. But the later, I got a better understanding. Uh, so, so, yeah, one sentence. It's a disguised architecture change in the, that's why it didn't apply. Oh, I'm not, is there anybody who wants to respond? Otherwise, I so think- I'll, yeah, I'll, res I'll respond briefly. I, I think I agree partly with Leisha, but I disagree partly with Leisha in the sense that if um, cost and efficiency were not primary um, drivers of how you build networks as opposed to how you build applications on networks. We would just put a point-to-point -point link between every single endpoint and build a, build a you know, a, a giant um, mesh network and never have to route anything because every endpoint could talk directly to every other endpoint. So the whole notion of, an, of a network is a graph that is not fully connected, uh, but is spar it has sparsity in it. Um, is kind of fundamental to the way we, to, to to why we do networking as opposed to um, build distributed applications on a on a global broadcast infrastructure, right? So when you want to push something down into a lower layer that is involved with a, with the fundamental problem of, of of dealing with sparse connectivity and the cost structure of that connectivity. Uh, I think networking is mostly about cost and performance, not about functionality. I wouldn't disagree with that, but I want to point it out. The network revolution starts from applications and not from network itself. The, uh, I see the CDNs do the trick. They, they now do perfect job, it's good enough and it's based on, it's a patch on the IP, everything works. So that's why I'm saying that no fundamental new things, and there's no architecture change. On that, actually, I would agree with the George's comments earlier. That is, this is this new fundamental change, that is the security. It's not only we secure the data directly, that has tremendous advantages from today's approach of securing the channels. But on top of that, like David Clark uh, wrote a paper somewhere recently and saying that security challenges is not about crypto. Crypto actually works, quantum hasn't come yet. It's about key management. And so therefore I think the semantic, semantic naming and the ways everything is named security data. And the really open, I see really open this a new direction of automating the security reasoning and hence the key management. That, I think it's a key to the new future. And that is something that TCP IP cannot offer. <clears throat> yeah. I, I just put one comment in Slack, but I'll say it again here, which is that you, you, you do care about the the graph because you care about latency and you care about availability and no matter if you had 100 percent connectivity you don't have 100 percent availability and you don't have zero latency because of physics and so in icn you care where the caches are because you want to get content to eyeball and you know you it may be about to expire but the user might be about to expire too and multicast cared about latency very much uh, and the availability question is, I think, significant because that means you need copies. And the BBC, for example, has built a very cool system which makes everyone's home digital recording system a cache. 
uh, that's a very cool technology. It's an ICN style technology. Uh, you integrate the, the fact they have a broadcast, digital broadcast backbone. Uh, most people have a receiver that can record any program so they can time shift, but they can then redisk that content to their neighbors. Modulo, you know, you can have the key distribution thing separately. That's fine. It can be encrypted. So we get the key, but the uh, reduction in latency for everyone is significant. So it's not just a bandwidth multiplier of multicast or a bandwidth multiplier of caches. Uh, it's a latency reduction and an availability increase. And those two things are significant. And they're also help with sustainability because you uh, don't move the content so frequently over many different paths. And we quite like the planet to, to last a bit longer, please. So I don't think um, this sort of everything's connected so everything works and you don't need, you know, I, I'm back with it. You do need routing, you do need uh, optimization and you do need resource allocation um, to care about things. And, you know, now we figured out how to do uh, a lot of this quite well, but actually we still need to, to worry about the physics and uh, uh, we don't worry about the physics. We can't change the physics, so we need to take account of it. Um, so, um, so I think somebody actually did ask the question on Slack. Well, the big concern, yeah, Hitoshi Asada said, said the big concern about ICN is selecting the best path for ICN junk based routing and selecting the best cache. And I, you know, I claim that is that's uh, that still maintains some of the problems of the analogy I made with multicast. You can't get away from it because that is about availability and latency, as well as about resource allocation for you know bits moving across the network. Uh, and it's orthogonal to the question of uh, bit ownership and and keys, but it, it's it's not separable completely because of the the cost implications and bundling and so on. So uh, I think that's enough for me. We're probably out of time as well. I think I'm not sure. I'd yes. like to just yeah. one last thing, Thomas, for a second, because I I mean I think this is something that would would benefit the research community in ICN a lot, which is uh, starting from what Lisha just said which is to clearly articulate what are the things that we have pioneered in terms of object security, key management, and trust for ICN that can't be done equally well at layer seven without worrying about doing anything at layer three, just layering it on top of IP. What, what are the real fundamental benefits of not having this type of security? Because I think everybody will agree that it's a major step forward, much of it pioneered by this community. But what is the benefit of doing it at layer three? And I think those benefits exist, but I have not really, from my point of view, seen them clearly articulated. Because much of what Leisha said is already in Oscor, almost all of it. And that's purely at layer seven. I know very little with regarding to today's um, security practice, but as far as I understand, and through some discussions with people in the security area, this kind of uh, security policy reasoning does not exist. You want to layer seven. This utilizing of a semantic names to reason about security policies. I think there's like a limited number of papers all published years back uh, but in practice, there's no implementation or even this. So I think it's a semantics. I think this was a really, um, really good discussion, a really um, inspiring panel, which is mainly due to our panelists and but also to the to the many questions from the audience. Uh, and I guess it justifies the 10 minutes overtime, for which I apologize. Um, so I thank you all and uh, hope to meet you again soon in person. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. And so uh, we will start the session one from uh, 15, 11. 15, uh, 11, 15. So, okay, uh, please have a break. Please have a 20 minute, 20, 20 minute break. Thank you. Thank you.